A lot of people seem to think that stocks will return 10% or more per year on average. I think this belief is misguided and can lead to bad financial decisions. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital, and I'm going to tell you where the 10% return figure comes from, why it's probably not a good estimate of expected returns, and what a better estimate looks like. The assumptions that investors make about expected returns impact important decisions like how much they need to save, how they allocate their assets, and whether they should invest or pay off debt. Small differences in expected returns can have big impacts on decisions. This makes estimating expected returns an important exercise, but many people seem to believe that stocks will return 10% or more per year on average. To understand why this is problematic, let's start by understanding where the idea that stocks return 10% per year on average comes from. Going back to 1950 through 2023, US stocks delivered a nominal, before inflation, annualized return of 11.32%. For the 20 years ending 2023, the total US market returned 9.81% annualized. The genesis of that often quoted 10% figure is easy to see, especially for people primarily familiar with recent US market history. Before going any further, we need to make a distinction between nominal and real returns. It doesn't actually mean much to say that the stock market returns 10% on average because nominal returns don't put food on the table, real returns do. Take the 15 years ending April 1985 as an example. The US stock market returned 10.58% annualized for 15 years, which seems great, but inflation ran at 7.05% over the same period, eroding a huge portion of the nominal return. For this reason, it's important to think in real terms. The real return on US stocks from 1950 through 2023 was 7.63%, and it was 7.16% for the last 20 years. To be clear, this roughly 7% real return is still exceptional, even for the US market. From 1900 through 1950, US stocks returned a real annualized 5.57%. The big question is whether the pre-1950 sample or the post-1950 sample are more relevant in setting expectations for the future. To make this determination, context matters. A significant portion of the exceptional return for US stocks over the more recent period is due to rising valuations. From 1950 to today, US stock valuations increased dramatically. Rising valuations are not something that investors should count on repeating. Valuations are kind of like a weak form of gravity in financial markets. High valuations suggest lower expected returns, not higher. The question of whether pre- or post-1950 returns are more representative of expected returns was examined by Eugene Fama and Ken French in a 2002 paper. I know the paper's a bit dated, but US market valuations are similarly high today as in their analysis period. They estimate expected stock returns from dividends and earnings to judge whether the realized average return is high or low relative to its expected value. They find that their estimate for the expected equity risk premium for the period 1872 to 1950 is very close to the realized equity risk premium over the same period, but that the 1951 to 2000 realized risk premium is almost three times their estimated premium. This suggests that the earlier period delivered on expected returns, which should inform expectations, while the later period delivered unexpectedly high returns, which should not be counted on expectation. Their evidence suggests that the higher return post-1951 is due to rising stock valuations driven by falling discount rates. This context is important because falling discount rates indicate lower expected returns going forward, not higher. The idea that rising valuations drive up past returns and push down expected returns while investors assume that the high returns will continue forever has been called the rearview mirror bias. A more recent paper examining past US stock returns suggests that survivorship has contributed a significant amount to the historical US equity premium. Basically, the US has been lucky. Disasters that could have happened to the US and have happened to other countries simply have not happened. As a result, investors have learned over time that the US market is safe. This learning has driven down the discount rate, driving up the valuations of US stocks. The combination of good luck and valuation increases together explain about 2% of the historical US equity risk premium for the period 1920 through March 2020. The thing about the US being a great place to invest is that everyone knows that it is. Prices for US stocks are high, reflecting how awesome investors think the market is. But again, high prices suggest lower expected returns, not higher. For future returns to resemble the past, there will need to be more good luck, more rising valuations, or some combination. Netting the 2% return from luck and learning out of the total return, 
the real return on U.S. stocks over the period examined by the paper is 5.28%, a figure much closer to the pre-1950 U.S. return and, as you will see in a minute, to global stock returns. Historically, U.S. stock returns have been high enough to be deemed a puzzle, the equity premium puzzle. They're much higher than the predictions of most economic models. One of the ways that researchers have tried to resolve the equity premium puzzle is by looking at data outside of the U.S. market. Global real stock returns back to 1900 through 2023, excluding the U.S. market, are 4.35% and 5.16% including the U.S. market. Research drawing on data for 38 developed markets extending as far back as 1890 and using block bootstrap to simulate plausible return scenarios finds a median or real 5.28% return for international stocks and 4.78% for domestic stocks. Remember, the often cited 10% or higher average nominal return for stocks is roughly equivalent to saying a 7% or higher real return. This 7% figure is about 2% higher than unbiased estimates of U.S. expected returns, U.S. stock returns before 1950, and global stock returns for periods spanning 1890 through 2023. To answer the question posed in the title of this video, no, stocks do not typically return 10% or more per year on average. U.S. stocks specifically did for the last 70 or so years, largely in the back of rising valuations, but global stock returns for the last 124 years and U.S. stock returns from 1900 through 1950 were much lower. At PWL Capital, we need to have estimates for expected returns to give people financial advice. Rather than using relatively recent U.S. historical returns and ignoring valuations, we start with the global historical return from 1900 through 2023, remove the return over that period attributed to valuation changes, and then account for current valuations. We update these figures twice a year and post them on our website. Following this process gives us a real expected return of 4.62% or a nominal 7.24% assuming 2.5% expected inflation. These figures are before fund fees, which should also be accounted for. Net of fees, PWL's expected return for a total market index fund portfolio is a nominal 7.08%. The difference between a 10% and a 7% expected return is huge. It may not seem huge, but remember that returns compound over time. With small changes in expected returns, differences in things like how much you need to save for retirement, how much you can spend in retirement, and when you can retire can be huge. I do want to make sure it's clear that I'm not suggesting that stocks are bad investments or that people should avoid the stock market. In all of the long-term historical data that I've mentioned and in PWL's expected returns, stocks have beaten and are expected to beat bonds. The main takeaway is not that stocks are bad, just that their expected returns are not as high as many people think. Using one of the best historical periods for one of the best performing stock markets as an estimate of expected stock returns, especially when valuations for that market are currently at the 97th percentile of expensiveness relative to history, a condition associated with lower future returns, is, in my opinion, a little ridiculous. More reasonable estimates include the historical experience of global stocks and account for current market conditions. Both of these adjustments point to lower expected returns relative to recent U.S. stock market history. Fortunately, PWL runs these numbers twice a year and posts them on our website for free. Thanks for watching. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. If you want to learn more about how PWL applies sensible expected return estimates to financial planning and portfolio management, you can book a meeting with us below.